Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in Junior English. We now turn in your hymnals to page 1094, 1095, and we're going to introduce you to the great Toni Morrison. Many have said that Toni Morrison is the most influential and important living author today in America. Um, she was born in 1931, as you see at the top of page 1095. Your textbook company has a serious problem on their hand when they want to introduce you to Toni Morrison because she has written some of the most important <coughs> novels of the, of the uh, late 20th and early 21st century. But the problem is how do you, do, how do you cut uh, a, a part of a novel out and, and show the genius of Toni Morrison? So what your textbook company has done is to provide us with an eulogy, it's called, a, an essay about the great writer that we, uh, that we just uh, uh, met a few moments ago, Baldwin. Let's go ahead and read a little bit on page 1095 about Toni Morrison, again, born in 1931. The first African-American woman to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. Wow, I would write that down. That's huge. Toni Morrison is renowned for works that explore the experiences of black women and men, as well as the harsh realities of racism and sexism. She grew up in Lorain, Ohio, nurtured by her family's love of stories, songs, folktales. These early experiences inspired her to study literature in college and become a professional a professor herself. Later, she worked as an editor, preparing books by such well-known figures as the boxer Muhammad Ali, the writer uh, Tony Ked uh, Bambara, and the activist Angela Davis. Uh, novelist side, this is the next uh, heading. Morrison's career as a writer was launched with the publication of her first novel, The Bluest Eye, in 1970. I, I highly recommend this one to you, although it is very, very controversial. Depicts the struggle of a black girl who sees beauty as a trait held only by white people. She longs to have the blue eyes of her movie star idol, Shirley Temple. Sula, in 1973, focuses on a friendship that challenges the prejudices of a small community. Again, each one of these are just hallmark novels that I recommend to you to read. The Song of Solomon in 1977 presents a narrator's search for his own identity. And then, of course, Beloved, 1987, many have argued her most influential novel. A novel inspired by the true story of Margaret Gardner. Tells the tale of an escaped slave who is recaptured by her master. Jazz in, 1920, in 1992 tells a sweeping tale of passion set against the backdrop of Harlem in the 1920s. Final heading, Honoring Legacies. In addition to novels, Morrison has written literary criticism and children's books. Her writing reflects her deep respect for the wisdom of others, especially generations who have gone before her. She points out that, quote, there is always an elder, end quote, in her writing. Again, quote, these ancestors are not just parents. They're sort of timeless people whose relationships to the characters are benevolent, instructive, protective, and they provide a certain kind of wisdom, end quote. In her essays and interviews, she often pays tributes to writers like James Baldwin, who have inspired her. I love the quote at the bottom of that page on 1095. Look at it, and maybe it will inspire uh, one of you. She says, if there's a book you will really want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. The beautiful, beautiful quote. All right, let's jump over now to uh, page 1094 and literary analysis at 2B. And uh, let's get this word in bold in your, uh, in your notes, a eulogy. Write that one down at 2B, the rhetorical level of, of reading and study. A eulogy is a literary work written to pay tribute to someone who has died. Eulogies are defined less by their form, which may be a speech, an essay, or poem, and more by the subject and occasion of the writing. Okay. Like, for example, we did a, we did a, a poem recently, the, the Hayden Offering, Frederick Douglass, is, an, is a classic example. Right. Usually written shortly after the subject's death, they celebrate the person's strengths, virtues, accomplishments. For example, that is the astonishing gift of your art and your friendship. You gave us ourselves to think about, to cherish. A eulogist creates a mood, let's write that word down, an emotional quality that expresses his or her feelings and captures qualities in the person being honored. Mood is invoked through word choice, rhyme, syntax, sentence structure, as you read, note the aspects of James Baldwin's life that Toni Morrison celebrates. Notice, too, the emotions she evokes and the literary devices that add to the feelings. Under reading strategy there on page 1094, we're going to be analyzing patterns of organization, the order structure of ideas. In this eulogy, Toni Morrison follows a clear pattern where she discusses the three gifts. I'll write that down at level one. Three gifts that Baldwin gave to the world. 
the pattern of threes is an ancient narrative structure. We sometimes call it the trinities, right? Fairy tales, folk tales, myths often tell of three siblings, three tests, and so on. The idea of the three gifts is a part of the Christmas story to which Morrison alludes. In using this ancient archetypical structure of the trinities, Morrison both organizes her ideas and communicates a sense of Baldwin's depth as a literary artist. And then, of course, you have a chart there that can help you with each one of those three gifts. By the way, uh, do point out to yourself that you've got four vocab words at the bottom of 1094 that you're wanting to work on uh, for the examination. Let's take a look at the background information on 1097 quickly. One of the great writers of the 20th century, James Baldwin, was an inspiration to many readers and writers. Toni Morrison wrote this essay to pay tribute to his influence on her and the entire literary community. Now let's jot down really quickly at level one. I'm going to give you a schemata for how to read this, okay? Uh, Morrison's essay remembers her friend and mentor, she'll call him Jimmy in the first word, James Baldwin, whose excellence challenged her to, quote, think at the top of my form, end quote. She recognizes three gifts that he gave. Let's write them down really quickly. Again, I'm already setting you up for this. One was his language. She's going to say it was honest, controversial, I'm sorry, conversational and direct. The second gift was his courage and moral authority, and his third gift was his tenderness and caring. These three gifts combined to form Baldwin's lasting legacy to both Morrison and, of course, to all of us. His works will continue to inspire people to achieve their goals through clear language, courage, and tenderness. Let's read together now. We'll pause momentarily. As we read, we're taking notes at level one. And we're just going to flesh out what it is that she has to say about this amazing writer. If this uh, eulogy essay does anything, and I hope it does a number of things for you, one of the things that I hope that it does is maybe interests you in reading more Toni Morrison and, of course, uh, works by James Baldwin as well. Jimmy, read with me, uh, 1097. Jimmy, there is too much to think about you and too much to feel. The difficulty is your life refuses summation. It always did. And invites contemplation instead. Like many of us left here, I thought I knew you. Now I discover that in your company, it is myself I know. That is the astonishing gift of your art and your friendship. You gave us ourselves to think about, to cherish. We are like Paul Montana watching with new wonder, his brother saints knowing the song he sang is us. He is us. And by the way, the, uh, the uh, uh, footnote at the bottom tells you that the narrator of Baldwin's novel, just above my head, who describes Hall Montana, who describes the troubled life and death of his brother Arthur, a gospel singer. Now back to the uh, second paragraph. I never heard a single command from you, yet the demands you made on me, the challenges you issued to me, were nevertheless unmistakable, even if unenforced. That I work and think at the top of my form, that I stand on moral ground, but know that ground must be shored up by mercy, that the world is before me, and I'll need not take it or leave it as it was when I came in. Well, the season was always Christmas with you there, and like one aspect of that scenario, you did not neglect to bring at least three gifts. You gave me a language to dwell in, a gift so perfect it seems my own invention. I've been thinking your spoken and written thoughts for so long, I believe they were mine. I've been seeing the world through your eyes for so long, I believe that clear, clear view was my own. Even now, even here, I need you to tell me that I am feeling, I'm sorry, I need you to tell me what I am feeling and how to articulate it. So I have poured again through the 6,895 pages of your published work to acknowledge the debt and thank you for the credit. No one possessed or inhibited language for me the way you did. You made American English honest. Let's write it down. See, she's giving us now the very first gift. Genuinely international. You exposed its secrets and reshaped it until it was truly modern, dialogic, representative, humane. Dialogic here, by the way, means conversational. In other words, uh, some of you even pointed this out. The professional reader who read Rockpile, you pointed out how amazingly smooth that reader was able to read that, that uh, prose. And of course, a huge part of that is just because of the brilliance of James Baldwin's prose. 
You stripped it of ease language and false comfort and fake innocence and evasion and hypocrisy. And in place of deviousness was clarity. In place of soft, plump lies was lean, targeted power. In place of intellectual disingenuousness and what you call exasperating egocentricity, you gave us undecorated truth. The top of page 1098. You replaced lumbering platitudes with an upright elegance. You went into that forbidden territory and decolonized it, robbed it of the jewel of its naivete, and ungated it for black people so that in your wake we could enter it, occupy it, restructure it in order to accommodate our complicated passion, not our vanities, but our intricate, difficult, demanding beauty, our tragic, insistent knowledge, our lived reality, our sleek classical imagination, all the while refusing to be defined by a language that has never been able to recognize us. In your hands, language was handsome again. In your hands, we saw how it was meant to be, neither bloodless nor bloody, and yet alive. It infuriated some people, those who saw the paucity of their own imagination in the two-way mirror you held up to them attacked the mirror tried to reduce it to fragments which they could then rank and grade, tried to dismiss the shards where your image and theirs remained, locked but ready to soar. You are an artist after all, and an artist is forbidden a career in this place. An artist is permitted only a commercial hit. But for thousands and thousands of those who embraced your text and who gave themselves permission to hear your language, by that very gesture they ennobled themselves, became unshrouded, civilized. The second gift, here we go, write it down in your notes now at level one. The second gift was your courage, which you let us share. The courage of one who could do as a stranger in the village and transform the distances between people into intimacy with the whole world. Courage to understand that experience in ways that made it a personal revelation for each of us. It was you who gave us the courage to appropriate an alien, hostile, all-white geography because you had discovered that this world, meaning history, is white no longer, and it will never be white again. Yours was the courage to live life in and from its belly as well as beyond its edges, to see and say what it was, to recognize and identify evil, but never tear or stand in awe of it. It's a courage that came from a ruthless intelligence married to a pity so profound it could convince anyone who cared to know that those who despised us need the moral authority of their former slaves who are the only people in the world who know anything about them and who may indeed be the only people in the world who really care anything about them. When the unassailable combination of mind and heart of intellect and passion was on display. It guided us through treacherous landscape as it did when you wrote these words, every rebel, every dissonant, revolutionary, every practicing artist from Cape Town to Poland, from Waycross to Dublin memorized. Quote, a person does not lightly elect to oppose his society. One would much rather be at home among one's compatriots than be mocked and detested by them. And there is a level on which the mockery of the people, even their hatred, is moving because it is so blind. It is terrible to watch people cling to their captivity and insist on their own destruction, end quote. Let's just pause for a moment and identify what an amazing quote that is. Think about what it is Baldwin is saying. It's much easier to just fit in. It's much easier to just play along. It's so much harder to stand up to what's wrong to challenge yourself to be better, that's way harder to do. And of course, Baldwin was challenging all of us to do so in, in his quote. Let's go to the top of uh, 1100 now. The third gift, here we go, let's write this down. The third gift was hard to fathom and even harder, harder to accept. It was your tenderness, a tenderness so delicate, I thought it could not last. But last it did, and enveloped me it did. In the midst of anger, it tapped me lightly like the child in Tish's womb, something almost as hard to catch as a whisper in a crowded place, as light and as definite as a spider's web, strikes below my ribs, stunning and astonishing my heart, the baby turning for the first time in its 
incredible veil of water announces its presence and claims me, tells me that in that instance, that what can get worse can get better. In the meantime, forever, it is entirely up to me. Yours was a tenderness, a vulnerability that asked everything, expected everything, and like the world's own Merlin, provided us with the ways and means to deliver it. I suppose that is why I was always a bit better behaved around you, smarter, more capable, wanting to be worth the love you lavished, and wanting to be steady enough to witness the pain you'd witnessed, and were tough enough to bear while it broke your heart, wanting to be generous enough to join your smile with one of my own, and reckless enough to jump on in that laugh you laughed. Because our joy and our laughter were not only all right, but they were necessary. You knew, didn't you, how I needed your language and the mind that formed it, how I relied on your fierce courage to tame wilderness for me, how strengthened I was by the certainty that came from knowing you would never hurt me. You knew, didn't you, how I loved your love. You knew. This then is no calamity. No, this is jubilee. Our crown, you said, has already been bought and paid for. All we have to do, you said, is wear it. And we do, Jimmy. You crowned us. Let's now turn to a quick level 2A. We've obviously worked level one as we've gone through the major gifts that are being provided here. Let's jump to 2A and possible themes messages here. Let's go ahead and say it out loud. Obviously, this is a eulogy. This is a tribute passage, right? Notice she's saying to James Baldwin, thank you. Thank you. One of the major messages then of this small text, this eulogy, is the need for courage in the face of wrong. The need for honor in the face of the inappropriate. The need for grace in the face of hostility. Notice that the genius of this passage is that Morrison is speaking directly to, right, we could jump to 2B to make this observation. She's speaking directly to James Baldwin, who of course has already passed. Who she's really speaking to, of course, is to not only herself, but to all of us who are admirers of Baldwin, whether we know it or not. Many of my juniors never even heard of James Baldwin until we've read Rockpile. And then they go, there's something really profound about this story, and it just has a tendency to kind of catch me and hold on to me. Um, that's the genius of Baldwin. And if it leads you to go read Go Tell It on the Mountain or any number of his other classic novels, and that's the, that's the whole idea uh, for Morrison's uh, um, eulogy as well. Of course, we've already pointed out in 2B the power of trinities, the power of threes. She says there's three things that made you remarkable. And then she kind of lists those, those three things, keeping it easy for you, the reader, to pay attention and know exactly how to read this eulogy. Let's jump to 3A. We, if we learn anything... We're connecting new to old, as we've said many times in 303. So let's work at this third level, or the relational level, and let's relate to other titles. Right away, of course, we can relate to any number of other titles. Again, we've already mentioned uh, Robert Hayden's um, um, Frederick Douglass as a classic example of a poem where Frederick Douglass is celebrated for his courage, for his grace. Right? Very similar kind of uh, project going on here. Let me ask it this way. Do you have a tribute song on your playlist? It is a song that you know of that was written and sung to celebrate somebody who is gone or somebody who has done something really important. Do you have a song like that? If, if for you, is there a, is your, do you have a favorite movie that celebrates a living person who maybe is no longer living, an actual person? What is your favorite, what we sometimes call biopic? In other words, it's a movie about a person. Do you have one of those? And if you write it down, ask yourself this question. What is most celebrated about that person in that favorite text of yours? Do you have a novel that comes to mind? Do you have a favorite book? I, I once had a junior that said, it's really funny that you would point this out. 
Because I guess it never occurred to me that one of the things I did for a while while I was in middle school was to begin to read biographies and autobiographies. And in biographies, books written about someone famous by somebody else, I began to realize that what they were really doing was telling me, without saying it, you should consider trying to live this way. Of course, we think, don't we, of that Longfellow's Psalm of Life and those famous lines, right? Um, lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing leave behind his footprints on the sands of time. The idea, of course, is directly attributable here. If you are an artist, if you are a writer in the 21st century, without even realizing it, you owe some kind of tribute to somebody like James Baldwin who had the courage to stand up and challenge the status quo brilliantly, artistically done as well. Of course, we think about Ralph Waldo Emerson, don't we, the great American transcendentalist and his essay, Self-Reliance. He who would be a man must be a what? Nonconformist. And, of course, that fits right in with this kind, of, this kind of reading as well, doesn't it? All right, let's turn to 3B. We want to always relate whatever we're reading to ourselves, to our own experiences. So let me ask a couple of questions and you can write them down. Question one. If right now you had to sit down and write a eulogy for one person in your life who is either past already or will someday pass, if you had to write a tribute statement, if you had to choose one person in your life and say to that one person, there's three things you've done for me that nobody else could have done for me. Who is that person? Write down his or her name really quickly. And then very quickly, write down three reasons why that person, just, it doesn't have to be a long sentence, three reasons why that person has been so important in your life. 